I want to know, how do you feel when you're making big decisions? Sometimes uh, we, we make decisions we can, uh, boy, the process can be really different for different people. Uh, you and I, we handle our decision making really differently, most of us. And uh, I wonder, gosh, am I doing the right thing? Are we, uh, is this going to, am I going to later on learn something that's going to make me feel like this was unwise? And, and whatever that is, hey, boy, I, I stressed about getting engaged. Other people feel really confident when they first get engaged. I'm very happy that I got married. <laughs> I've made the right choice. I'm glad. Uh, but boy, all those things for us are how we do with our money, how we, uh, we wonder about other people's motivations, all those things as part of our decision-making process have been with us not only now, but have been around for a long, long time. Uh, we are taking some weeks to look at the book of First Thessalonians, and we're in a series that we're calling this Vital Faith. And as part of that, uh, we, we see that, that Paul went to the city of Thessalonica and spoke to them. And the people, after he left, started to wonder about the decision that they had made to follow Jesus. And Paul was worried that they would have left the faith and said, ah, that, let's, this was not a good idea. Let's look at our passage for today in 1 Thessalonians 2. Verses 1 to 12. So if you've got your Bible app or if you've got your Bible in front of you, you can open it up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's in the section of your Bible that has all the, in the New Testament toward the end, all the T books are all together. Thessalonians and Titus and uh, Timothy. He says this, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Amen. Lord, we ask you to help us to understand your word and to put it into action this week. Amen. Well, I, I love that at the end he says, look how holy and blameless we are. If only you and I would be able to say that, to look back and say, hey, didn't you see how amazingly holy and blameless I was when I acted among you? Would that it were so for us. Well, sometimes these difficult situations, difficult decisions get thrust upon you. And that is what happened to the Thessalonians. Paul had been there in Thessalonica, but the city was in uproar and the, he had to leave rather quickly and get out of there and go on to another city called Berea. And afterwards, the city was still so upset, they actually sent people after him to chase after Paul and cause problems for him in the next city along. Uh, but... When Paul and his companions left, what do you think their friends were saying to them about this new faith that they had? They had become believers, and then suddenly Paul had to leave in the middle of the night. And I think one of the easiest ways for them to undermine the message of Jesus was just to say, hey, you know what? That guy Paul came through here, and you know what? He, he's, he's just in it for himself. He was trying to get a little bit of money out of you. You were taken in. Don't feel bad. You know, we all make mistakes. Just move on. And uh, don't, don't worry about this anymore. You can find a new, new life. Come back to the old life that you had before. Were they just trying to make money, though? People are going to say similar things to us today. They're going to say, hey, this is not 
uh, this was not in your best interest. You know, I want you to take your, sure, you can have faith, but don't take it too seriously. Uh, you know, things shouldn't get out of hand. You're, you're, and what they mean by that is that your life needs to look more or less like what other people's lives look like. So they'll say things like, hey, you know what? A lot of people give to charity. Let's not make it too much. Let's, you know, you, you can... You can give your life and love babies maybe, but I mean, really, are you going to want to take care of new infants right now? What does it mean for you to care for uh, homeless people? Really, you're going to spend the night at a homeless shelter? Isn't that a bit much? You know, just give a little bit of money to that. Doesn't that kind of take care of that? Uh, sure, you know, boy, you know, you, you want to volunteer at the blood bank, but you shouldn't do that too much. And Well, I, well, actually... If, if we're talking about, like, donating blood, that's probably a good one. You probably shouldn't do that one too much, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, a lot of people probably had been saying that Paul and his companions had been preaching for more or less selfish reasons, that they were just trying to keep the system going. And word of that rumor had gotten back to him. And so Paul goes, basically, in this passage we just read, he says, really? Is that, is that really what you saw of me? Let's... Let's roll back the tape a little bit on that one, and uh, let's see what it says. Uh, you know, I was beat in Philippi with rods for my faith, and when I continued on the road, I came here, and there was persecution, but I still dared to tell you the message. And, you know, when people are beaten with rods, usually that tends to shake out some of the charlatans in this thing. I was doing this because I am committed to the mission of Jesus. I want you to know the Lord in this way, and I was willing to face that for you. So the, even though things heated up again and again for Paul, he's willing to get back out there and to do it again. He says, that is not the mark of a charlatan. I'm not trying to please you. I'm not trying to please other people. I want to please God. An example I thought of when I was thinking about this is, you know that some of us in this church are going to be running for World Vision to raise money for clean water across the world. And one of the most compelling speakers that we've got is a guy named Rich Rell, who came through a few years ago and swindled all of you into doing this running gig. So now you're making me do it too. So I'm, I'm not bitter or anything, but I hate running, and so I'm going to take it out on Rich Rell. But, you, you know, you could say later on, maybe people would say about Rich Rell, you know what, water is just his job. It's his job to convince you to run. That's how he raises money. That's all he cares about is just keeping this thing going so that he can have a job, so that he can da 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 That's all it is. It's just a scam. But that's not the case. If you know the guy, if you've met the guy, he believes in this. He wants people to have clean water. He wants people to have life and to not be, and for such a simple thing, to motivate a few other people to care about something that matters. And so he's willing to put energy into it. He's willing to spend his life. He does crazy runs himself across here, across the South Coast. So we can, people could undermine the message with cynicism and say, no, they're just trying to perpetuate something. Or the reality is that somebody has really tasted that there is something more important than chasing after his, a job that he had to leave to be there at World Vision. He's willing to give up his life for this thing. So Paul, he's, he is responding to this kind of thing, and he says, this is the life I lived with you. And he uses some interesting language as he does that. And when we look over the text, I see some things that stand out. Verse 7, he says, Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Verse 11, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. If you rewind a little bit back up, in verse 6, As apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. There's some textual variation there. It could be translated as gentle, but uh, one of the, them is this bit about young children. Basically, I see family imagery there. Whether it's gentle or children, it's family imagery. A nursing mother, a loving father, this is an image of good family relations. And Paul and his companions have acted like good parents to these Thessalonian believers. And I think the reason that they were able to be good parents to them is because they have allowed their own lives to be parented 
by God. We are going to be looking this morning at a few of the marks of good spiritual parenting, not only in what Paul and his companions have done for the other people, uh, but what God has done in their lives. And I, I think it's going to be the mark for all of us, all of us, whether we're parents or just loving other people around us, for what kind of marks of spiritual parenting have on us and how they should flow out from us. Well, the first mark that I see is that God, the mission that God has given them has made them courageous. It, it makes them gutsy. They have got backbone. Because even the things that they faced in the past, they're willing to continue moving forward. They're people who are sent by God. And they say, you know, I don't even need to conceal my motivation. My motivation is I have been given courage because God is in me and God has given me this thing. Verse 2, we had the courage to tell you. That's the common English Bible. There's a couple other translations. NIV says, we dared to tell you. Or ESV, we had boldness in our God to declare to you. I think of a parent advocating for their child. You know, someone, even somebody who's probably normally pretty mousy, suddenly will find quite a bit of courage and backbone. Say, you call to the doctor and your child is sick and they say ah you know what there's not really enough time this evening to be able to see your your child boy that parent even if normally they are not very pushy will suddenly find a great deal of backbone and courage to push through say hey you need to see my kid this evening the the parenting instinct the love for the child can is, is convincing in us, it's in our heart that moves us toward courage. It's, I think it's that sense of responsibility, the sense of love that gives that backbone. He says, For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. And they're not doing it to please people, but to please God who tests our hearts and not flattering people, not trying to, to butter people up, it, because that would start to think, make us think that that's about greed. We think, obviously, the people who are trying to sell you something tell you everything that's great about you. Uh, he says, no, 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 that's not what it looked like. We didn't seek glory from people, neither you or from others. Even though we could have made demands on you as apostles of Christ, we were gentle among you. We were like little children among you. They were people who were courageous because God had already instilled in them, had already been parenting their hearts to welcome them in. They were people who knew they had this locked-in relationship with God that wasn't going to move, and so it gives them courage. The second parenting bit that God has put in them is that it makes them selfless. Good parents carry the weight of responsibility for their kids. Uh, and I could probably point at almost any point in this text here, but if I look at verse 9, it says, For you remember, brothers, our toil and labor. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. It's verses like this that make us think that probably Paul was there a little longer than just three Sabbath days. I'll say that too. That he, people had time to see him at work. That he was funding his own mission to, to be there. That, you know, they could have made demands. We could ask of you, but I didn't. I proved that I was not greedy. In fact, I worked. I, didn't, I wasn't asking from you. I paid my own way. One of the basic traits of a parent is that they love their children selflessly. They're, they're willing to put up with sleepless nights from the time they're babies until... Uh, when, does it, when does that stop? I, Linda, do you still worry? This, do you have sleepless nights still? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I think we don't, we don't ever, I don't know, if those of you with grown children, I, do, have you stopped worrying? I'm wondering if there's an end point for me. I don't know. Maybe I'm in this one for the long haul. So, you know, loving, loving co connection between parents and kids is not transactional. It, it, it's selfless. It's, we give of ourselves for someone else and Boy, that teaches our hearts, doesn't it? It's good for us, trains us as believers 
to do that thing that probably we should be doing for other people as well. But, you know, nobody, though, looks at a mom in a grocery store when their toddler is on the floor having a tantrum and thinks, you know what, she's just in it for the glory. That's what it is. <laughs> no, she, she might be composed. She might be kind of losing it herself. But any, whatever happens, you are looking at her and you're thinking, you know what, there is something terrible happening to this poor person in the spaghetti aisle. And that is a mark of selflessness that we see. And Paul and his companions, they say, you know, we gave of ourselves. We, we earned our way along, and we were not trying to get from you. We, we didn't get what was due to us, not in money form and not even in glory form, not in getting from you to tell me how great I am. And, and I think we can demonstrate that same kind of selflessness in our lives. I think we, we can be people who take initiative toward other people to say, if selflessness looks like me not waiting for them to move toward me, but for me to move toward them, whether in friendship or forgiveness or outreach, other ways. I think we also are willing to displace ourselves, to, to make ourselves uncomfortable for the sake of the other person. I, I think of maybe somebody when they're first dating somebody else and you're willing to kind of let your arm, like maybe that love person, that girlfriend and boyfriend falls asleep and your arm falls asleep too, but you're not willing to move so that they'll be comfortable. We, we're willing to put, have discomfort in us so that other people can be comfortable. And I think in our place here, for example, we are willing to displace ourselves to greet other people, to uh, maybe even make our campus more accessible to people who are visiting for the first time. We're, we're willing to go somewhere else for something uh, because it's more comfortable to somebody else than doing it here. Uh, we displace ourselves from our comfort zones. Maybe even places where I feel like I have power I have authority. I'm willing to give that up like Christ for the sake of the kingdom. Well, so they are courageous. They are selfless. And a third mark of good spiritual parenting is that good spiritual parenting makes us engaged. Look at the, the, the people who came to preach in Thessalonica. They were open. Their, their teaching wasn't concealed, but they also they, they knew who these people were so they could love them well enough to tell them the truth, to, to speak words of comfort, to, to give them a challenge where they needed it. They needed to know these people intimately. Verse 12, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you. Look, they exhorted you, pressed them. You need to go challenge you like a coach. My, I, was at the, the, I was at Crunch yesterday, and I heard the person doing the, the cycling, yelling at the people as they were cycling. And my, my son, who I had taken just to go swim in the pool, we were just horsing around the pool, uh, he says, why is she yelling at them? <laughs> I said, she's trying to get them to, to, to give as much as they can because they want to grow in this. They want to get stronger. And so that's what that word exhorted is. It's we exhorted you, we're challenging you, coaching you, encouraging you. We encourage you, give you words of encouragement. And we charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. He says, I try to give you all the tools necessary. I, was, I wasn't just buttering you up. I wasn't just being mean. I was giving you what you needed so you can move toward maturity. God calls you into his kingdom and his glory. And, and we also saw that, you know, they lived that life among them. They showed by their example. Uh, that was a, a powerful image for them was to be able to show them that they were engaged with them, let them into their lives to engage with them. They encouraged, they comforted, they urged. And you know what? That just, it takes a lot of emotional involvement to do that. And I, sometimes we're not always willing to do that. And it, we don't have the reserves or whether we just don't have the space. We have failed at times there as well. But for us to be, to have the good spiritual parenting that God has given us, it looks, the mark of it coming out of us is that we are engaged giving our kids what they need. 
I, I read a story some time back uh, about something that happened during the deadly fires in Santa Rosa several years ago. I don't know, maybe it was around 2017, something like that, in the fall. Uh, I don't know if you remember that time. Uh, and I read a story about something that happened during that time. Uh, there was a, a doctor, neonatal doctor, who at 2 a.m., this guy named Dr. Scott Witt, he got a call in his home telling him that the fire was coming toward the hospital and they were going to need his help to evacuate some of the babies that were there under his care in the intensive care unit at um, Sutter Santa Rosa Regional Hospital. And these are, a lot of them were preemie babies, really little, needed a lot of care. And so the fire that had erupted several hours earlier now was um, going across the city. It ended up burning a lot of the city. Uh, but it was moving in on the city, and they don't think they even realized at that point how dangerous it was going to be. But the flames were coming closer to the hospital. And so he jumped in his truck. He said, I'm going to drive down to the hospital. I'm going to help out with this thing. And as he's getting closer, he gets to a point where the road's blocked, and there's just so much traffic from people leaving, trying to flee the fire. It wasn't possible. <laughs> What's he do? He turned around, drove back to his house, got on his motorcycle, and he rides his motorcycle up to the police roadblock. They let him through, knowing what his job was. And so they, they let him get through. And he gets to this neonatal unit. And uh, in, as the flames were coming closer, you know, they had to move the babies and try to get some in, ho in ambulances so they could go uh, several miles down the road to another hospital. And it came down to the last couple of babies. And he gets them in the, in the ambulance. Whew. Got it there, right as the flames are coming right up to the hospital, and he leaves. And he says, I, wanted, I needed to be there with the babies, so I followed this ambulance on the way. He said, you know, the smoke was so thick, I couldn't even see. I had to follow behind in the, the stream behind the ambulance so that they would even use their lights, and I could see where I was going. And he says this. His quote was the part that really drew my attention to this article. He says, I wasn't really thinking about the danger because I was just thinking about what the babies would need. I know each baby personally, and I know what they need, and I wanted to pass that on to their new doctors. I wanted to be there for them. Wow. Here's a doctor. It's an amazing story, but this doctor exhibited all of these things. The, he showed the courage and selflessness and personal engagement, too, of knowing about these babies, that that's the ideal that we are wanting to live up to. You know, when we think about good parenting, though, that might touch a nerve for you, yourself, you know. Maybe your example, in your, the example in your lives of parents was not of people who were courageous for you or selfless towards you or engaged with you. Or even if they were, they probably weren't all the time, right? And, and if you're a parent now, you, I know that you are not all the time either. And maybe you can play back the tape in your own lives and, and say to yourself, you know, I wish that things had been done differently in this or that circumstance. And I'll tell you, you know what, you don't even have to be a parent to be able to play the tape back and wish for that, right? We, we all know that our childhood experience is hugely formative. It shapes who we are. And those, that it's, could be good or bad or in between. And we know, but we know that the best parents even fail Sometimes. And even as adults, we're going to grieve and we may feel really suddenly uncovered when our parents pass away. We sense the need for our parents. Here's what's amazing. is Our Heavenly Father is here. And the Christian life is an invitation for us to be parented by God. And even if you had great parents then in a way they were actually reflecting some of the beautiful courage and engagement, the generous heart of their God who made them. And when we feel like we've fallen short, you know, we're just sensing that there's a gap between the way that we're acting and who God has made us to be and who God is himself. Too often, you know, we have continued following broken patterns that we've built up over years, maybe as a result of having to defend ourselves or having to live life in this broken world. In fact, we may have done it for so long that we can't even really separate it from who we are nowadays. But God is a good parent 
working in us to transform us even now. It doesn't matter how long you've been walking with God. God is a great example of a parent. You know, you want to talk about courage? Christ is the one who could have turned away in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, no, God, God, take this cup away from me. He wanted to do something else, but he chose with courage to move toward the cross. Do you want to talk about selflessness? In the book of Luke, before he teaches about the Lord's Prayer, before Jesus talks about the good Samaritan or before he talks about the lost son, in 751 it says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go toward Jerusalem. That Jesus decided selflessly that he was going to give up his life for us. Do you want to talk about someone who's engaged? Christ meets us here in our real-life situations, and especially when we don't make the grade. He speaks into our lives now, into the situations that we're having. And what's amazing is we see in the gospel that this God who loves us so much is parenting us. He says, you have been approved by God, it says in our passage, to be entrusted with the gospel. You, you need encouragement. You need comfort. You need urging to live lives worthy of the kingdom of God, of course. But you are called into his kingdom, into his glory. And that part is already settled. You are invited in. That's the kind of loving, comforting parenting that we have that gives us a basis that we can have confidence in the world. So we're invited to reflect God's courageous, selfless, engaged parenting now in our own lives. So I I wonder who the people are that God has given you to love right now. Is it maybe your family? Uh, If you are a parent, you already do love and care for your children, but but we want to do that in a gutsy and selfless and engaged way and in a way that proclaims the gospel to them. Is it your neighbors? I'm thinking of the people who are within maybe a two house radius of you if you're a student maybe it's your classmates god is calling you because you are welcome in god's family calls you into his kingdom but our desire his desire for us is that his parenting care of us is going to remake us transform us so we can get rid of the things that are fake and really become the people that god wants us to be people who reflect him in this world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this passage in Thessalonians and for the example of Paul and his companions. I, I, I pray just for a moment that we can reflect that you are the one who parents us. You have been a good parent. You're present in our lives. May that knowledge, may it remake us In your image, we pray. Amen. And that does remind us, of course, 